Since time immemorial, people have wondered where they come from, where they're going, and who they are. Humankind has reinvented the world again and again, always believing in the possibility of a better future. 500 years ago, Martin Luther started the Reformation, transforming the way people worshipped and thought. Today, we're standing at another crossroads. I believe that I would love it to change, but I also believe that there's a lot of things that are really good in it already. And I also think that it's not the world that has to change, it's people. We live in an age that will shape the next 500 years. For the last 100 years, we've believed that if we work hard, try hard, we'll have a good life, heaven on earth. But now we're starting to see that's not how it works. Heaven on earth, peace and justice all over the world. Why are these goals so elusive? Communication has become boundless. There's never been so much prosperity in the world. But we still haven't put a stop to poverty, war, and terror. Martin Luther's Reformation promised a God who did not ask people what they had to offer. He was a kind and fair God. What would make today's world a fairer place? Who are the people today spreading ideas and knowledge? David Diallo is an entrepreneur based in Berlin. He's preoccupied by the question, how can we make the most of the immense freedom we now enjoy? Society today is addressing completely different questions. It has a completely different perspective because it has total access to information. People know so much more now, even at an early age, and they know different things. They have to deal with all this information, and that affects who they are. David co-founded Enorm, an online magazine about sustainable management. He believes that the only way we can rise to the challenges of our age is by taking the long view and assuming individual responsibility. The modern age as we know it dawned in the 19th century. This is when Europe's major cities were redesigned with wide avenues and busy squares where traffic intersected. The populations of these booming cities exploded Man began harnessing the world 200 years ago, aided by the combined forces of capital and industrialization, best symbolized by the steam engine. It brought about undreamt of wealth, but was also a useful tool of war and exploitation. A new world of work was also born, one in which people struggled to achieve social justice and equality. Issues that also preoccupied 18-year-old Friedrich Engels. We want to get out into the free world. We want to overrun the barriers of prudence and fight for the crown of life, action. We are put in prisons called schools, police for thinking, for speaking, for walking. They have left us only the semblance of action, a meaningless chase of profit at any price. For the first time in the world of work, humans were replaced by machines efficient and noisy machines. The pursuit of growth meant progress was inexorable, progress that is only starting to hit a wall today. The way we've organized the world is utterly warped. We used to think that machines were going to relieve the burden of work and that the democracy we invented would make the world a more just place. Maybe it did, but today, with populations exploding and resources running out, we really need to come up with a plan B. 
We can't carry on producing, consuming, carrying on with business as usual. We need new gods. Didn't Luther's Reformation urge Christians to show compassion and help the less fortunate? Friedrich Engels grew up in Westphalia during a period of rapid change. Around 1800, the region had become Germany's first industrial hub. The Wupper Valley was home to plentiful supplies of water and coal, which were used to power industrialization. Engels' father was a wealthy lace manufacturer. He was also a pietistic Protestant who went to church every day, accompanied by his wife and son. Engels grew up in a world that was intellectually and spiritually circumscribed, where profit was everything. The 300-odd weavers who worked at his father's factory also lived on the premises. Even children worked on the looms. Engels Sr. saw his prosperity as God's reward for his hard work and humility. Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. I spent nine years at Catholic boarding school. We got up early for the liturgy and all that. It left a mark on me. Let me put it this way. The church's value system gives you an inner compass. It taught me that having a value system is an important foundation of how we live together in a society. But what happens when a value system is based on inequality? This was a question that preoccupied Friedrich Engels. Is it fair that some people possess capital and machinery, while others merely have their labor to offer? His father took him out of school against his will and in 1838 sent him to Bremen. He became an apprentice in an office on the Weser River. The death of one child more or less does not doom a pietist's soul to hell, especially if he goes to church twice every Sunday. Of all the factory owners, the pietists treat their workers the worst. In secret, Friedrich Engels began writing about the social injustices in his father's factories. For David Diallo, it's also his Christian values that guide his work. He develops ideas and makes money out of them. In 2004, he and his brother founded the online service myphotobook.de. Their yearly revenue soon topped 10 million euros. After I'd been running an online business for a while, I started wondering what it was all about. Did it all have any meaning? How could I give it one? What it means is that on the one hand, I earn a living, but on the other, I'm using my qualifications and skills constructively and making a contribution to solving society's challenges. Despite the fortune he's amassed, he hasn't lost his values. He used his wealth to help fund Enorm, a magazine for sustainable economic strategies. David is a follower of the Good News movement. He believes it's important to focus on good news and to learn from successful sustainable living and business practices from all over the world. Good exists, it does, but we don't hear enough about it. That's our founding principle. We believe in turning the spotlight on good initiatives, projects, businesses, products, people and jobs. In 
In the 19th century, before the telegraph, let alone the internet, had been invented, supplying the entire world with news was undreamt of. The oldest news agency in the world is Reuters in London, and it's still the most cited. It was founded in 1851 by Paul Julius Reuter, who came from Kassel. Everyone's heard of Reuters, but not many people know about its founder. Good morning, my little pigeons. Where are you off to today? Brussels. If another is faster, you have to be better. If another is better, you have to be faster. That's how it is with the telegram. But our motto is different. We must always be faster and better. Fly safe and fly fast, my little pigeon. In the century of the steam engine, the fact that news and stock prices from the stock exchange could reach people swiftly helped spur growth. Today, information remains a sought-after commodity. News from all over the world reaches Reuters in London by satellite. Speed was vital. Speed was vital, but as, as now, Reuters is very much the same DNA. We need to be fast, we need to be accurate, and we need to be free from bias. We need to be fair. And so those were the three sort of pillars of what Reuters did at the beginning, and still very much drilled into our journalists today. Speed, accuracy, and freedom from bias. Starting in the 19th century, the twin goals of growth and achievement became deeply rooted in the human consciousness. Increasingly, machines set the pace. The pressure to be faster and more efficient grew. I would force companies and very rich people, I would force them to think about how much wealth is enough for them. Uh, I would force them to recognize that the uh, pursuit of profit, endless pursuit of profit, is actually destructive for the planet. I, I would rethink growth. I would rethink a more modest model of, um, our, of growth. But how can one earn money in a responsible way? David wants his business to set a new benchmark for the digital industry, with practices such as profit sharing, for example. And although profit is important, it's not the top priority. The idea of social business is based on redistribution and ownership shared by employees and even customers. It's a relatively new way of approaching business. David isn't just concerned that he profits, but that his employees do too. For industrial workers in the 19th century, it was a long struggle to free themselves from the chains of subservience. Profit sharing and justice were distant visions dreamt up by utopians. Guaranteed solidarity, the idea that the have-nots have a right to welfare and not merely charity, is one of the basic principles of modern society. Two hundred years ago, Friedrich Engels realized that his father's unbending religious faith was actually completely self-serving. He wasn't the slightest bit interested in the Christian idea of compassion. He distanced himself from his father and published Letters from Wuppertal in a Bremen newspaper, his first manifesto on social justice. Out of 2,500 children of school age, 1,200 are deprived of education and grow up in the factories, merely so that the manufacturer need not pay the adults, whose place they take, twice the wage he pays a child. 
Driven by his strong sense of justice, Engels argued the case that everyone deserved the same opportunities. Engels would have been livid if this had been pointed out to him. But if you read his book, The Condition of the Working Class in England, you can sense his moral outrage. He had a conviction people simply shouldn't be treated like that. Engels was rational enough not to give free rein to his anger at injustice. He also wanted to analyze it. A sojourn in working-class Manchester, the world's first industrialized city, left Friedrich Engels even more critical of Christian faith. And today, is the church, religion, still the arbiter of justice? My guess is most people these days worship at the altar of money. That's what they get off on. That's why they do what they do. Why do they go to school? To make money. But to worship money is to worship a false idol. Even if we had a third less, if wealth was evenly distributed throughout the world, we'd be a thousand times better off. Our conscience would be clear. The images we see on the internet, or in the news, or in the papers, it can't be right. You see what's happening, and you can't just carry on. You just can't. Back in 1850, Paul Julius Reuter didn't have a torrent of images and information to contend with. His main concern was finding a way to send telegrams as fast as possible. During the revolution of 1848, Reuter and his wife Ida Maria published pamphlets championing democracy. They fled to Paris to escape the Prussian police in Berlin. In Aachen, they founded a small telegram office, closing the gap in the telegraph line between Berlin and Paris with their fledgling pigeon post business. Herr Reuter, the latest dispatches are here. Bringing news from the stock markets in the financial centers of Antwerp and Brussels. One day, the news wasn't good. The gap in the telegraph link between Berlin and Paris was to be closed. The telegraph line will be completed by Christmas, the triumph of progress. Telegrams directly from Berlin to Paris. We'll soon be on the street again. Then Reuters heard about the World Exhibition in London. They splurged on train tickets with money from Ida Maria's father, a banker. The railway is a feat of human ingenuity. The devil himself couldn't travel more swiftly. With 28 participating countries, the Great Exhibition in London in 1851 was the first ever World Fair. It was a dazzling display of technical and cultural progress, showcasing industrial wares and machinery, as well as treasures found in the colonies. We're so clever we've caught up with the devil. And before he even notices, we've gathered speed and overtaken him. I'm in awe of humankind's innovative power and scientific achievement. It's fantastic. I foresee a world in which everyone has access to information and can use it to evolve, to behave less like savages, and in the end, 
to become more mindful. Etwas, uh, geistesgegenwärtiger. Faith in the future. In the 19th century, this meant improved mobility. The world's first railway line was built in 1830 between Manchester and Liverpool by engineer Robert Stevenson. Just 15 years later, Friedrich Engels traveled by steam locomotive to the north of England. As soon as you start paying a lot of money for something, you expect more. If you've paid for first class, you expect the train to be on time, the toilets to be clean, the lights and the heating to work, just because you've paid more money. It's actually very strange that you expect so much, even though we all just want to travel from A to B. It's very strange that there are still two classes. Why does this still exist? Friedrich Engels was headed to Manchester, where his father was part owner of a weaving factory. Engels and Marx wanted to be in first class, but they wanted everyone in first class. The intelligent left, which includes Marx and Engels, always argued for the abolition of the second class. Time and thought have gathered pace. People led their lives according to their image of God. But now their inventions have outstripped them. Shepard Pepper is from New York but lives in Paris. He's a photographer. He's exhibited his work in a number of Paris galleries. Photography is really cool because it's like um, nothing lasts, right? And the more, you, the closer you get to that, the closer you're gonna be free. And taking a photo is the one moment when you capture an instant. You know, there's tons of other cool stuff going on, but when you take that little moment and you take that little photo, even though it's not gonna last either, it's like you're playing. It's the ultimate irony, trying to capture shit. You know what I mean? It just it makes me, it's fun and it's poetic. You can dream, you can look over at the moment again and again and again. Even if all he does is capture a moment, Shepard's photographs are visual documents of our times. The most important thing is my, is my message. You know what I mean? It's like um, I want I want I want to I want to like stir people and move them, you know, and inch them towards themselves. It's like they look at themselves in the mirror for real. Or just they don't look in the mirror, they just look inside. He goes out with his camera every day on a quest to capture fleeting moments that will help inch people towards themselves. It's no coincidence that photography was invented in the same era in which Engels and Reuter lived. In France, the discovery of a method of recording an image on a light-sensitive material marked the birth of photography and the birth of man's desire to capture and reproduce his own image, a desire that led ineluctably to the era of the selfie. Starting in the mid-19th century, people could visit faraway places, framed like a painting from the comfort of their own front room a different location every second. The origins of film and television. Flip books.
The most popular motif of photography was a patriarch surrounded by his family in a supposedly realistic setting. The aristocracy used to have their portraits painted. The wealthy middle classes had their photograph taken. It was remarkable how the technician and photographer replaced the genius. There was no longer a genius painter capturing the character of some illustrious person. There was just, you click the button and we do the rest, as the famous Kodak slogan goes. Light waves were recorded, full stop. What effect does that have on the self? It becomes objectified. Genius is diminished. The status of the technician is enhanced. And the self, the subject, has to reposition itself in this new media landscape. When man began harnessing the world, he also began harnessing its image. Having one's photograph taken was evidence of success. I and the new year over time. Taking selfies is no different. It's a way of saying, I was there. A way of marking out your place in the world. If people don't have egos, ego like is great and important to f fulfill what you want to do, like your, what you believe in. But when people start um, imagining stories about themselves, you know, like thinking like that there's something special, well then if people stop doing that and then they would just be able to interact, like in freely interact. Friedrich Engels arrived in Manchester in 1842. While he was exploring the city, he met Mary Burns, an Irish worker. People have always been wrong about themselves, about who they are and who they should be. Mary was the love of his life. Theirs was a love story that was ahead of its time, transcending class barriers. The sentiment of love, the ways in which people met each other was highly structured. It was highly sequen sequential, and it was built like a story, like a narrative. As soon as they started a relationship, they had a story. We say a love story. We don't have any more love stories because when you start a relationship today, you don't know if it's a one night stand, if it's a relationship for one week or for one month or for um, something longer. Friedrich Engel's father had sent him to Manchester to become a proper manufacturer. Up to 2,000 people labored day and night in the local cotton factories. Even children worked at the looms. Their health was often ruined. Mary showed him around the slums where thousands of Irish migrant workers lived. Right at the entrance to one of these courtyards is a latrine with no door, which is so filthy that the inhabitants are forced to cross a stagnant puddle of rank urine and excrement to go in and out. This is slavery, plain and simple. The capitalists have you chained. These factories will destroy all vestiges of humanity. Do you think we aren't human? You're angry at your own people, but you don't know what it's like to be completely naked. I pray every day for things to improve, 
but I see God has cast me aside. We're all connected and we should all realize it, totally. If everyone looked out for the person nearest him, just for that one person, the one person closest to him, then everyone would be all right. The flourishing English industry had helped London become Europe's leading financial center. Paul Julius Reuter and Ida Maria founded a business in the city that supplied customers with news from the colonies and the new theaters of war. Good morning, sir. Morning. The Reuters had no shortage of customers. Almost every English daily newspaper subscribed to their service. On time. We have Paris, New York. Reliable, incorruptible, clear insights and a thorough grasp of what behooves him. These are the qualities the Reuters office must demand of its correspondents. A lot depends on the news supplied to the world by the agency. We did it. We have to have the technology to get the news back to the system, and we have to have the technology to get it out to our clients. So there's technology all the way through. So if you take Reuter, he started with his pigeons, and he moved on to the Telegraph, and that was groundbreaking at the time. And when I started, I had to go to a payphone with coins to put the coins in to speak to the editor to tell the news. Now I have my iPhone and I'm on chat and I'm, I'm sending the news live from my phone. So it's changing so quickly. Today's world is flooded with information. The Industrial Revolution that took place 200 years ago has been well and truly supplanted by the Digital Revolution. The language we speak, uh, the personality we have, the people we have met, our friendships, our taste, what we dislike, on and on and on. It's all information at the end of the day. And that's what we describe as a mental life. If you are sort of mentally dead, that's the only way of being outside the infosphere. But if you are mentally alive, well, you are up here, totally immersed in a world of information. Prominent Shia Muslims in Iraq have flashed out at Saudi Arabia. The internet allows everyone to make the news. An unedited deluge of first-person experience, viral videos and conspiracy theories competes with serious media reporting for our attention. The whole world is jostling for clicks and likes. To news pioneer Paul Julius Reuter, a critical public was the ultimate goal. The sooner people learned of crises, the more they would be able to change things. We only find out what's happened long after the event. All the news foreshadows even worse events. The civil war is raging in America. If only we could find out what is happening faster. Then one day the world would be a better place because it would see what war really means. One night 150 years ago, he stumbled across a canister washed up on the Thames. It gave him a brilliant idea for a way of bringing news to the public even faster, triumphing over time and space. It was an extraordinary idea. Steamships from America would throw waterproof canisters containing news from Reuters overseas correspondents into the sea off the coast of Ireland. 
Small fishing boats would retrieve the dispatches, which could then be telegraphed from the mainland to London, arriving before the ships had even reached port. Reuters canister post worked. His news arrived eight hours before his rivals. Once the first underwater cable linking Calais and Dover was laid in the English Channel, Reuter was also able to add the continental press to his customer base, delivering news from the New World twice a day. One day Friedrich Engels found a library tucked away in an old abbey amid factories and slums. England's very first public library. It had been founded in 1653 by a wealthy merchant. Here Engels came across writers already taking a critical look at the nascent industrial age. books on the origins of the divide between rich and poor and on the duty to improve society. Engels began to write his own study of working class conditions in Manchester. Women made unfit for childbearing, children deformed, men enfeebled, limbs crushed, whole generations wrecked, afflicted with disease and infirmity, purely to fill the purses of the bourgeoisie. And all this in the heart of the second biggest city in England. He turned his observations into a rallying cry. Engels wrote the condition of the working class in England in order to shake people out of complacency and as a warning against exploiting and alienating workers. It's not enough for societies to be just and to try to distribute resources fairly. It is also very important in this world that we find ways of making people uh, have a sense that what they do matter and that their existence is meaningful for others. That's what I would call recognition. So thinking more deeply about um, what it means to recognize the skills and the worth of others. I am compiling a bill of indictment. At the bar of world opinion, I accuse the bourgeoisie of mass murder, robbery, and all the other crimes. In 1844, Friedrich Engels met Karl Marx in Paris and found a kindred spirit. After the failure of the revolution in 1848 in Germany, they both fled to London. In 1867, Karl Marx published a book that would change the world. Capital, Critique of Political Economy. Its publication was financed by Friedrich Engels. Engels remained together with Mary Burns until she died. They never married. Forgive me, Mary. A new era is dawning, where we can let the whole world see our love. I do sense that many people carry with them a very deeply rooted pain because of injustice. We're aware of so much. Facebook is always showing us pictures of dead children washed up on beaches and beheadings and so forth. We see all this. 
Und das, das, das wissen It's wir. not just conspiracy theories. I think it all makes us hurt. And the thing is, humans desperately long to be happy. Digital media has accelerated the world. But many no longer see speed and growth at any price as the gods of progress. It's time to invent a new world, one in which we're all free to develop a sense of purpose and to flourish, a world that fosters mutual consideration and community. Shouldn't that be absolutely amazing, exciting, inspiring? So that seems to me the, the human project, making sure that the mental flourishes in the best of all possible ways. And that is an open project. It doesn't have to be this or that for everybody. It has to be a opportunity for everyone to flourish in the best of all possible ways. It's immer ein klein there will always be some injustice. But the basic idea is that all of us here on Earth must be treated fairly. Freedom doesn't mean taking yourself off to some island and waving goodbye to the world. Freedom means being joined to the world. You can't just go your own way. You have to take everyone else with you. Freedom and responsibility are inextricably linked. 